Hi, my name is Michael Dickinson, and I'm a professor of biology and bioengineering at the California Institute of Technology. This is my third in a series of lectures on how flies fly. In my first two lectures, I discussed the topics of lift, that is, how flapping wings generate aerodynamic forces, and power, that is, how the muscles are able to flap the wings back and forth in these tiny insects. And now I'd like to focus on the third topic, which is control, how the animals are actually able to use sensory information to regulate the activity of the muscles, to move through the world and perform the behaviors that they need to within their natural history. So, like any flying uh, agent, insects have to control six degrees of freedom. That is, they have to control their rotations about the yaw, roll, and pitch axes, and they have to translate themselves, in which we conveniently describe as thrust, side slip, and lift. And the basic way that they do this is through tilting of their stroke plane. So, if you imagine a flapping insect, it's a little bit like a helicopter. It flaps its wings back and forth, and over the average of one stroke, there's a stroke average force vector that's pointing upwards and a little bit forwards for an animal that's moving slowly through the air. If the animal wants to move a little faster, what it needs to do is tilt forward, therefore bringing that force vector a little bit more in the forward direction, and that will accelerate it through the air. So, indeed, insects are a lot more like helicopters than they are like airplanes. And we should take this into account when we consider how they are controlling their flight. We can get a little bit of a sense of this in this high-speed video sequence, which was shot at 7,500 frames per second of a fly escaping from an electronic fly swatter. And if we look at that sequence as a photomontage and go to the critical um, part of the sequence, we can see that basically what this fly has done is it's rolled its body over by about 90 degrees. So now the force vector that was sticking upwards is sticking sideways, and that's what's accelerated the fly in a different direction. So that's just a little bit about how flies are regulating the forces that they're generating in order to steer and maneuver. But an important element of considering flight control is all the sensors that the animals are using to control those changes in aerodynamic forces. And this is where flies really excel as, as flying devices, because they have a lot of cool sensors all over their bodies that are critical for flight. For example, they have very, very fast visual systems. So, the, the eyes of flies, we believe, are the fastest known visual uh, systems on the planet, approximately 10 times faster than the visual systems of humans. And even though they have a lower spatial resolution, they have this much faster temporal resolution, which, of course, is useful if you're moving through the world very, very quickly, as flies are during flight. They also have a separate set of eyes on the top of their head, called ocelli, and the ocelli are very useful for determining the horizon and also for measuring uh, changes in body rotation that are very, very fast. Now, I gave a whole lecture on the aerodynamics of the wings without telling you something else about wings, and that's that wings are not just aerodynamic organs, they're also sensors. Wings are just chock-a-block with various sensors, including sensors along the leading edge, sensors at the base, um, that allow the fly to measure the distortions of the wing as, as it flaps, and also to even use its wings uh, for taste and possibly odors. Now, on the head capsule of the fly are two important organs called antennae, which function as the nose of the fly and also as a sophisticated mechanosensory device that can tell the animal the apparent wind, how air is flowing over its head as the fly moves through the air. And the olfactory function of the antennae is very, very critical uh, for the fly finding the food that it needs to uh, continue its, its life history pattern. Flies have extraordinarily sensitive noses. This is why if you open up a, a, a bottle of beer, uh, or a glass of wine. Flies seem to appear from, from, from nowhere. They're doing so because they're smelling those odor plumes with their antennae and tracking them up, up, upwind. Now, 
I could give a whole lecture on this next sensor, which is a fascinating structure called the haltier. Flies are unique among insects in that they have transformed their hind wing into a structure uh, that functions in part as a sophisticated metronome and in part as a gyroscope. In my second lecture on power, I discuss the role of steering muscles and how steering muscles of the wing function as little controllable springs that regulate wing motion, and that the fly is able to uh, vary the stiffness of those muscles by changing when those muscles become active in each stroke. So if you think about that, that means the fly has to have a really precise timer uh, or a series of timers so that the steering muscles know exactly when to fire. Well, the haltier, this little tiny drumstick organ that beats back and forth at wing beat frequency, is one of the sources of this important phasic information. In addition, the haltiers function as a gyroscope by detecting the inertial rotational forces, or so called Coriolis forces, that occur when the fly rotates during flight. And it's largely because of this gyroscopic sense that other insects don't have that flies are able to perform uh, fantastic maneuvers. Now, any discussion of control wouldn't be complete without the central nervous system, the brain, that is taking in all this sensory information from all these modalities and turning it into a motor code that regulates the muscles controlling the wings. So all of these topics are important when we consider control. And there's one other, really, more of a philosophy that I'd like to discuss um, before getting into some of the interesting behaviors that flies have. And that's what I call an integrative approach. Because in order to understand uh, flight control, we, we can't just take any tiny piece of the fly and study it in isolation. We really have to understand how the fly functions as a cohesive whole. So you can imagine that a neuroscientist might focus his or her attention on, on the, the nervous system, which is generating all the patterns of activity to control the muscles I talked about in my last lecture. Um, however, that neuroscientist had better be good friends with somebody who understands a lot about muscle physiology, because the musculoskeletal mechanics are absolutely essential in understanding how the fly flies. And the way the muscles move determined the way the wings move, and the way the wings move determined the aerodynamic forces and all the processes that I discussed in my first lecture on lift. And that makes the animal move differently through the air. As it does so, the stream of sensory information that's coming into its brain is changing. And so you need to have very, very fast sensory systems, which flies have, to process that information. And that, in turn, regulates what the nervous system is doing. So what we really see as the exotic behaviors of flies is really the consequence of a series of sophisticated control loops that take in sensory information, regulate the, the circuits in the nervous system, regulate how muscles are working, regulate aerodynamics, change the animal's trajectory through space, and the whole loop starts over again. So this is why the topics of biomechanics, aerodynamics, neurobiology, cell physiology are all linked when we consider flight control. So for the rest of this talk, I'd really like to take a natural history approach, in part to give you a sense that, you know, flies, and particularly the fruit flies that I study, aren't just boring things that are hovering around your, your fruit bowl or your glass of wine when you're relaxing on a patio, um, but they're actually pretty sophisticated uh, organisms that are capable of, of really remarkable feats. Back in the 1930s, the great evolutionary biologist, Theodosius Dobzhansky, was perplexed by the study of fruit flies that he and his protégés were making in the southwest of the United States, because what they found is that flies that were hundreds and even thousands of kilometers apart were genetically very similar. So that was perplexing, because no one could imagine that a little tiny fruit fly, uh, roughly two to three millimeters in length, could travel uh, uh, hundreds of, of, of kilometers across open desert. So in the late 70s and early 80s, a series of biologists, including Jerry Coyne, did some what we might consider rather crazy experiments. This one done at Death Valley National Monument, um, which is now a national park. And what they did was release uh, hundreds of, or rather uh, tens of thousands of fruit flies um, in the evening at about 6 p.m. 
And at several uh, distant oases, they had buckets of banana mash, where by next morning, they looked to see if any of the fluorescently tagged... the flies were dusted with fluorescent powder so that they could be identified relative to any native flies. Um, And what they found in these distant oases is that uh, a squadron of 17 uh, flies... these are flies of the common fruit fly variety that uh, that I study... had made it a distance of 15 kilometers in one direction and about 7 kilometers in an orthogonal direction. So, to put this in perspective, this is, you know, getting to the order of several billion body lengths of motion performed by a fruit fly with nothing to drink, nothing to eat in between. So, these are really remarkable feats of of, uh, dispersal and navigation. So, if you imagine a more cartoon form, everything a fruit fly needs to do uh, to to, to get from the release site to the capture site, you begin to get a sense of all the things that um, flight control is necessary for. Um, A fly has to take off. A fly has to choose a heading so it doesn't just circle aimlessly in the desert. A fly has to navigate visual clutter. It doesn't want to crash into things. Um, It has to avoid getting eaten by the big, nasty predators that are out there. Um, And it has to find odor plumes, because uh, the odor plumes are really the only hope it has of finding a a, a nice place to, uh, to, to land you know, to, 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 to eat and perhaps find some of its conspecifics um, where it continue its life history through, through mating and all that other good stuff. So let's consider just some of these in the context of flight control. So let's start with choosing a heading. How does the animal um, fly straight across open desert? So imagine a fly going through a landscape like this. There's no obvious landmarks. There's no sort of giant uh, towers in the distance in which to fly. But it turns out that most of what a fly sees is the sky. And the sky has a lot of of, of useful information in it that can be used as landmark cues. And one of the most important that is used by many, many insects from locusts to honeybees to dragonflies to dung beetles is the pattern of polarization in the sky. So, when photons come from the sun and enter the atmosphere, um, they're randomly polarized. That is, the orientation of the electromagnetic wave um, can be in any configuration. But as those particles, those photons, um, reflect off of particles in the atmosphere, they become polarized in a way, in a pattern, that is related to the angle at which they reflect off those particles. So, I know that's relatively complicated. But the important take-home message is the result of this process called Raleigh scattering is that there's this coherent pattern of polarization in in the sky, where the the sky that is um, halfway between the sun and the so-called anti-sun is maximally polarized, and the orientation of the polarization it is a little bit like the uh, the world is a is a barrel with the sun on one side and the anti sun on the other, and where the rings of the barrel would go around is the direction of polarization. If you had a visual system that could see this pattern, you basically have a compass, even if you don't know where the sun is. And insects indeed have specialized cells within their visual system that allow them to see this pattern of polarization. So how do we know that insects are actually using it? Well, a graduate student in my laboratory years ago developed a a technique uh, for measuring the orientation responses of flies that we call a magnotether. So, what we do is we tether the fly to a steel pin. The pin is placed between the north and south facing surfaces of a magnet, and the poor fly can flap to its heart's content. It doesn't go anywhere, but it is able to change its orientation in space. Um, It can change the angle at which it's, it's heading. This whole device can be then taken outside, where the only stimulus the fly has, the only thing it can see, is the bright blue sky above it. And here's the results of such an experiment, where what we're plotting is the heading of the fly within the experimental arena. And the little gray boxes are indicating that every three minutes, what my student did was to rotate the whole arena, kind of play a trick on the fly, to rotate the whole arena and see what the fly's response was. And if you look at the data, you see that every time the arena was rotated, the fly changed its orientation within the arena. Now, this doesn't... might not make uh, immediate sense, but if we replot the data in real-world coordinates, 
what we see is that this fly, despite the fact that it was being perturbed every three minutes, was heading at exactly the same global compass heading. In this case, it was flying due east for 24 minutes, uh, a, a time duration for which it could have flown for um, two to three kilometers, using just the pattern of polarization in the sky. Now, I don't have time to tell you that the pattern of polarization isn't the only cue that flies can use. They can also use the sun. When the sun is in the sky, it's a very, very salient cue. And it's not just that flies fly directly towards the cue. That would be a behavior that we would call phototaxis. It's more interesting than that, that flies can actually choose to fly at some arbitrary heading relative to the sun. And this is how they can actually use the cue, just as a, a, as a mariner did before GPS and other modern technology could use the sun to, to navigate. This is indeed how monarch butterflies uh, choose their compass headings as they're flying north and south during their famous migrations. So by using the pattern of polarization in the sky and using the position of the sun, insects like flies, including flies, have a compass that allows them to fly straight. Now, when you're flying through the world, especially when you're close to the ground, you're not just seeing the uh, pattern of polarization in uh, the, the sky and the sun. You're also seeing the objects, such as vegetation, nearby. And this introduces a very, very important topic within a flight control. And that's the, the topic of optic flow. So optic flow is the pattern of motion that the world has on your eyes as you move through the world. So imagine this fly uh, traveling through, in this case, it's not the Mojave Desert, it's the Sonoran Desert, but uh, it's a little bit easier to uh, illustrate this point with big, tall columnar cactus. cactus. As a fly is flying through the, the world, as it's translating, the image that it sees is going to move across its retina. And, and this, in, in general, this pattern of motion across the retina is what we call optic flow. Now, the useful thing about optic flow is that the pattern is different depending upon what, how the fly is moving through the world. So if the fly is simply translating through the world, what it's going to see is a focus of expansion directly in front of it. And nearby objects, like the nearby cactus, are going to move very quickly. Distant objects are going to move more slowly. Um, and what we find, however, if the fly is to rotate um, as it's moving, then all the objects in the world are going to move around it opposite to the pattern of rotation, all at the same speed. So if the visual system and the subsequent neural circuitry is set up, it can use these cues for the, to control flight. So if the fly sees a large pattern of rotatory optic flow, it knows that it's rotating. If it sees a focus of expansion in front of it, it knows that it's translating through the world. And these are principles that uh, uh, engineers use in building autonomous systems, such as self-driving cars, that can make use of optic flow. So how do we study this in flies? How do we do experiments to probe uh, the importance of, of optic flow and flight control. Well, for many, many, many decades in techniques that were pioneered by, by Carl Gertz in Germany, we've been building flight simulators where we tether a fly to a little stick, we surround it with some sort of visual uh, device, now one that's uh, controlled by a computer, and we can perform experiments by measuring what the fly is trying to do. We do this with an optical sensor or a, a set of cameras that measure the up and down motion of the left wing and right wing. From this, we can determine whether the fly is trying to steer left and right or fly faster. We can then present the pattern, uh, rather present the fly with a pattern of visual motion and measure its turning response. This is what we call an open loop experiment. Or we can do a slightly more sophisticated experiment where we use a computer to, to uh, connect its turning response into the pattern of motion. So this is basically like letting the fly play a little video, video game. And the flies will happily do this um, for hours till they run out of energy. So what can we study about the pattern of optic flow and the importance it has at flight control using these sorts of techniques? Well, remember uh, that foreground objects move very quickly. So one uh, experiment that you might do is to give the fly just a vertical object, like 
you know, the world's simplest cactus, um, and, and allow it to play a closed loop video game where it can regulate the angular velocity of that object by, by changing its pattern of wing motion. And what you see are the results shown in this video. So you're actually looking at the screen that the fly is seeing. You can't see the fly because it's too small. But the fly is controlling the angular velocity of that stripe. And what does it do? It puts the stripe directly in front of it. Flies love stripes. This is actually not just true of flies, but all flying insects seem to be attracted to vertical edges. And maybe it's not so surprising because the natural world, the vegetative world, think of, 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 of trees and bushes, have lots of vertical edges in them. So one of the sort of key modules of insect flight control is this uh, attraction to, to, to vertical edges, which is probably because, remember, in optic flow, um, nearby objects are moving faster than, than, than far objects. This is probably an attraction to nearby objects that, that insects rely on. So it's a little bit like the donkey with the carrot uh, you know, hanging, hanging in front of it. Flies will actually perform this uh, behavior for, for hours until they run out of energy. Now, Let's consider a translating fly, but one that's not flying directly forward, one that's actually at a slightly uh, skew angle uh, relative to the direction of motion. So uh, aerodynamicists would say that the fly is yawed relative to its direction of pattern. What kind of optic flow would this fly see as it flies through uh, uh, a uh, complicated landscape? Well, we can perform these sorts of experiments as well. They're a little bit more complicated to set up. But what the fly um, in closed loop would uh, control is the focus of contraction or the focus of, of expansion. So we allow the fly to rotate those poles of expansion. So the pole of expansion would mean that objects are all going away. The focus of contraction would be where all the objects are converging. And we allow the fly to sort of spin that pattern around it, just as the fly did in, in, in the previous slide of, of a stripe. And we can ask the question, what does the fly prefer to, uh, to orient towards? And the results are shown in this video. And they're somewhat paradoxical. Because if you look at the video, what you'll see is that the fly likes to place the focus of contraction in front of it. Um, it likes to steer towards the point in the world where the optic flow is actually converging. Now, why is this uh, a paradox? Well, when a fly flies through the world, as I showed you in my optic flow introductory slide, it's going to see a focus of expansion directly in front of it. We, you know, we see the same thing when we're walking through the world or driving a car. So what I've shown you in that experiment in the flight simulator is that flies prefer to fly backwards. Now, that seems a little bit crazy. Because clearly, uh, this would not be particularly adaptive. So what is the solution to this uh, so-called forward flight paradox? Well, there, there are several solutions. And one you might, might guess if you remember how attracted flies are to vertical objects. So if you actually present the animals with a pattern of expanding optic flow, but you put a vertical edge right there, they'll actually fly towards the vertical edge. They'll fly towards the object and tolerate that pattern of optic flow without steering away from it. So this is a really good example that we find again and again in flight control systems that flies respond to different sensory cues. And when, to really understand what they're doing, you often have to put those sensory cues together in a single stimulus. But I want to tell you another solution to the flight forward flight paradox, which is probably more important. And this is better manifest in a type of experiment that we do under open loop conditions. So imagine we take a fly, and we just measure the steering responses that it generates, and we just present it with a, a focus of expansion at some arbitrary location that we choose. And because this is an open loop experiment, the fly can't do anything about it. You know, so this is a standard stimulus response type experiment. So you might see uh, raw data like this. You present stimulus motion. The fly steers. And so at each uh, uh, angular orientation of the focus of expansion, we can plot the fly's response as shown in this slide. Um, and so what these data are basically telling us is that if you present the expansion on the fly's left, the fly steers right. You present the pattern of expansion on the fly's right, it steers left. So the flies are steering away 
from the focus of expansion, which is basically what we saw in our closed loop experiment. However, the interesting thing happens, what if we turn down the velocity of that visual motion? So instead of giving really strong expansion, we give very gentle expansion, and we do exactly the same experiment. And what we find is that the fly's steering response completely changes signs. So now, instead of steering away from the expansion, it's actually steering towards it. So this strong response to steer away from expansion actually inverts if that expansion is gentle. And this begins to make, make ethological sense, because imagine if a fly is just flying through a field where everything's far away, it gets very, very gentle expansion. The optic flow is telling it, everything's fine, you're just moving forward, keep going, um, you're making good headway. However, if the expansion starts to get strong, it's basically uh, what would happen if the fly started to get into visual clutter where there's nearby objects, it's about to crash, it's got to do something, it's got to turn away. And so we, we think that these two reflexes, one in which uh, it flies towards general expansion, but flies away from strong expansion, basically is the means by which it can navigate through vi visual clutter. So it never uh, is in risk of crashing into a nearby object, but when objects are far away, it knows that it can safely fly forward. Okay, so we have this fly. It's, you know, it's made it through this, uh, this uh, Warren's nest of, uh, of, you know, tall columnar cactus. Um, but there are a lot of nasty things out there in the world that are trying to eat it. How does the fly steer away from those things? So it's an important thing to know. I'm giving this example because it's sort of illustrative of a lot of aspects of insect flight control, is that flies don't see the world the way we do. So you know, if we were to take a picture of a dragonfly, we might see something like this. But you have to imagine that a fly, a fruit fly in any event, is taking an image of the world through a 25 by 25 pixel camera. Um, and so under the absolute best circumstances, when the fly is right nearby, basically just about to get eaten, this dragonfly might look like something like this. If the dragonfly was farther away, all it would look like is just a small spot that's kind of in, in, in a sort of you know, dangerous way, slowly looming. So we've been able to study these types of reactions using high-speed video um, by putting the fly in a chamber um, where there's a laser system that detects when the fly is exactly in the center of the chamber and exactly in the focus of our array of high-speed video cameras. And right as it passes that, uh, that position, we play the nasty trick of presenting this really fast-looming object that's like a dragonfly about to eat it. And what does the fly do under these circumstances? Well, it, you know, it, it tries to get the heck out of Dodge by performing one of these uh, elaborate maneuvers that I've showed several times in this series of lectures. And it does so by rotating its body very, very, very quickly to reorient its um, aerodynamic force vector so that it takes itself away from the looming threat. And what we s s have learned from doing many, many of these experiments is, is that this flight control maneuver is pretty sophisticated. Because what's, what's encoded in red around the uh, fly is the position of the expanding um, uh, ersatz predator that's trying to, to capture the fly. What the red vectors show, color-coded for the position of, of this uh, uh, looming stimulus, is the the vector at which the, the body rotation vector at which the fly rotated to reorient its uh, aerodynamic forces so that it's, it, it moves away from the looming threat. So there's a mapping of the sensory stimulus coming in, this big bad looming predator, and the motor response that ensures that the fly steers away from the, th the, the predator as fast as it possibly can. And this is all done within a, a, a mere 20 milliseconds. Incredibly fast processing. And this is one of the things that's just uh, fascinating. The deeper and deeper you get into flight control in, in, in flies and other insects, is that these computations are done in such a rapid time scale. Okay, so let's say our, our little fly has uh, managed to avoid the predator. Now it's looking for a, a, a place to, to, to eat. Um, its best uh, strategy is to try to find an odor plume and attract that odor plume all the way to its source. And it, I've told you it has this really sophisticated antennae that can serve uh, in this, uh, to, to this purpose. 
But how does the fly actually track the odor plume? In nature, plumes are very, very uh, complicated things. Um, they're not simple filaments. They're not uh, s- sort of simple gradients of diffusion because the filaments of odor plumes break up into a chaotic uh, vortices. And so it's a very, very challenging task for an insect or any animal to come across an odor plume and even knowing, like, where is that odor plume coming from? Because it's not continuous structure. It's a di- discontinuous structure. So to study this problem, what my lab and many laboratories have done has built wind tunnels um, and created odor plumes, in this case, a simple odor plume, and flown the flies or other insects in the wind tunnel and carefully quantified their interaction with the plume. As is shown in this video here, the little worm-like structure is actually the trajectory of a fly as it's moving um, against the direction of wind um, and tracking the odor. And what the animal is actually doing uh, with a careful analysis is that every time it encounters the odor, it surges upwind. And every time it loses the odor, it starts to do a series of zigzagging movements we called casting behavior. And it's really the combination of these two behaviors, the surge, the upwind surge, and the crosswind cast that when we played iteratively for many minutes, maybe even many hours, can allow the fly to to track an odor plume all the way to its source. So in cartoon form, um, here's this uh, uh, principle. There's the fly. It happens to come into the the odor plume. What it does next when it contacts just one filament of odor is surge forward. Then if it surges out of the odor plume, it starts to cast back and forth, presumably, to find the odor plume again. And it just keeps reiterating this process um, again and again. Now, this would be a great strategy for tracking the odor plume, but when do you land? When do you know you're done? Um, uh, The fly doesn't want to do this indefinitely. And what we've learned from studying the reactions of flies in wind tunnels is that the response to odor actually triggers a very strong attraction to small visual objects. So this is a little tiny sequence of a fly in a wind tunnel. And what is indicated um, by the color that I've marked plume contact is that when the fly goes through that region, this is the first time it encounters the odor, it takes a short diversion to check out uh, three uh, black objects that are projected on the wall of the wind tunnel. Before the animal encountered the odor, it completely ignored these small black visual objects. There's something about encountering the odor, the antennae detect them, that that changes the way the fly actually sees the world. And so we call this odor-induced visual salience. And we think it has a very important role in guiding the fly to the source of the the odor, the chaotic plume. Because it's, it's not always easy to track the plume exactly to the source of the odor. So as you're tracking the plume, every time you see something, The little fly is probably saying, you know, that could be it. Maybe that's the source of the odor. Maybe that's the source of the odor. I got to go check it out. And so this is a case of uh, a high-speed video sequence that was taken in a a way that allowed us to change the focus of the high-speed camera as the animal was flying so that we could very carefully see how it, it first decelerates as it approaches the object, sticks out its legs, which are effectively its landing gear, Um, and comes to a nice stop um, on the visual object. Again, the attraction to the visual object um, was driven um, largely by encountering for this hungry fly this attractive odor plume. So just to complete the the fly's journey, uh, the fly uh, performs this cast and surge behavior, um, tracks the odor plume. Um, When it loses the odor plume, it casts. When it uh, it sees a a conspicuous object, which I've just sort of uh, cheesily cartooned here as a bunch of bananas, when it sees a visual object, it's it's attracted to those visual objects. The expansion of that visual object actually makes the animal decelerate. It also makes the animal stick out its landing gear in preparation for landing, um, and it lands. And now we've sort of completed this journey from takeoff to landing. Now, if the fly was lucky, it's found a nice piece of rotting fruit in which case it gets to you know, eat, fight, have sex, lay eggs, and then it basically repeats this, uh, this uh, process until death, and that's the, the happy life of a fruit fly. So in these three series of lectures, I've tried to tell you about what I think are the most important um, 
uh, three components of, of the flight of flies and other insects. How they generate lift, how they power the motion of their wings, and how they control their motion with all of the wonderful uh, sensory modalities that they have at their disposal. Before ending, though, I want to just talk a little bit about uh, uh, insect flight in general and about some things that we may need to think of um, as a uh, culture going forward. A group in Germany at the Creffield Entomological Society performed some experiments over the last 27 years um, that generated some rather alarming results. They pr uh, created, uh, or rather measured, uh, insects that were captured in a series of traps that trap specifically flying insects. So it's very relevant to the topics of these lectures. So these are flying insect biomass that was collected at almost 100 sites across uh, uh, Germany over 27 years. So the data um, are good in the sense that there was enormous amount of repetition. And what this group found is that over that 27-year period, there was a 75% drop in the biomass of the flies. That is to say, where there used to be three flies uh, or other flying insects, there's now only one. And these 27 years almost matches exactly the 27 years that I've been studying fly flight. Now, why should we care about the fact that insect biomass is decreasing? Well, recently there was a paper published in Science that quantified the decline in bird populations in North America over almost exactly the same period. And the best estimates suggest that almost 3 billion birds have vanished across North America. And the hardest hit among those birds are birds that are insectivorous. And the basic working hypothesis, or at least one of the major uh, forces that we think are responsible for this loss in, 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 in bird populations is the fact that they're simply running out of food because the insects aren't there anymore. So this is one of these cases where we're seeing the decline in an important group of animals, not just that's an indicator of, of loss of, of habitat, of climate change, um, uh, as we might describe a canary in a coal mine, but rather when we lose insects, when we lose all of that biomass that can fly around the world, um, redistributing itself for the benefit of all the animals that are eating it, we're not just seeing the canary in the coal mine dying, we're really seeing the whole coal mine collapse. So I hope you've enjoyed these uh, three lectures. I, 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 sorry to end on such a somewhat um, depressing note, but it's important for us all not to think about insects as you know, cool machines that we can study. They also play a, a, a very, very important role in world ecosystems. So I hope you enjoyed the three lectures and think before you swat next time.